Namaskaram. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm going to kind of uh, take off from what Dr. Himamuti spoke about, um, but I would like to rewind a little bit and talk history. Um, I'm not a musicologist. I'm a musician who asks a lot of questions, and that's about it. And um, because two things seems to be the essence of the whole discussion, raga, gamaka. This keeps coming back and back. Okay, you're okay. It keeps coming back again and again. Whole question of comprehension of raga and comprehension of gamaka, and um, that, in a way, is also the essence of uh, Indian classical music, whether it is Hindustani or Carnatic music, in its own different ways. So, I'm going to look at history specifically to connect it with the concept of uh, raga and gamaka as we understand it today in the Carnatic paradigm. Um, so I'd first like to look at Swara, the note itself, and uh, look at where we are. Um, we love to believe that Indian classical music as we sing it today is about, trace it to say, first century AD, uh, at least uh, to Nati Shastra, the Bharata. But the reality is that the classical forms that existed in the early part of the first, second, third century or anywhere were drastically different from what we understand as Hindustani music or Carnatic music. The basis itself was different. What has happened is that terminologies, expressions, and words have been transformed in different manuscripts through the years and reinterpreted according to the social, economic, political context of the place that it grew in. Therefore, if you look at Today's music is, is Shruti based, Shruti in the sense there's a fixed pitch in which we sing, whether it is Hindustani or Carnatic music. The music described as classical music in Natya Shastra was not based on a fixed pitch. Uh, that completely changes the concept of what the music was. It was very different, it's very difficult for me to explain it here in, in, in about a 40 minute lecture. It's, it would take far longer, but I'll explain to you that it was not based on a fixed pitch. They had a concept of seven notes, Sari, Gama, Padhani, and the position of these notes were fixed. Today, in Indian classical music, we have two different types of Rees, two or three different, two different types of Gas, two Maas, all this. Traditionally, the Shuddha Swaras, or the pure notes, were fixed. How were they fixed? They were fixed based on an interval that was fixed between them. So you had Sari, Gama, Padani. I'm going to grab that for a second. Can you shut that off? Shut it off. The projector? Is it too complex? I'll come in front. Okay, so so what they basically did, you, do I need to use another mic or you can hear me? Okay, what they, no, 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 don't worry, you can hear me. I sing, so they better hear me. Um, what they basically said is that Sari Gama Padani are the seven notes, but the position of the note is fixed, so you had no varieties for the notes. So how they defined it was, they said, between Sa and Ri, Rather, let's start with Sa. If Sa is here and Ni, that is the previous octave Ni is here, there is a gap of four Shrutis. This is the same term they used. Four Shrutis between Ni and Sa. And the note Sa was positioned on the fourth. Between Sa and Ri, it was three. Ri and Ga would be two. So basically, this is four value four, three, two, four, four, three, two. This was called Sajjagrama. Okay? So what they said is that this is fixed. So unlike music today, you couldn't have 
two varieties of re or three varieties of ga. But unlike music today, pitch was not fixed. There was no shruti. They didn't sing this in one pitch. So the pitch was not fixed. So you could have a melody that started with sarigama padani, another melody that started nisarigama padani. In Western classical music, for example, you could, all the frequencies were fixed. In Sajja Grama, this is the frequency. Yeah, Nisa, not, this is not Murchana. Murchana is when it is Sarigama Padani, Nisarigama Padani, Dani Sarigama Pada. Those are the Murchanas. Those are, Murchanas are basically melodic sources, basic melodic sources. Now, to just give a very uh, basic comparison, don't compare literally. In Western classical music, you could have the same notes, but they produce different melodies. You get different melodies. So if somebody sang a melody starting with, say, nah, as the note, if that is sa, you could have a melody that sounds like that. Another melody that is based on ni position, which can sound different. So fit, fixed frequencies for the notes, but not fixed pitch for the music, which is exactly the inverse of what we do today. We have a fixed pitch, but we don't necessarily have fixed frequencies for all the notes. You had another thing called Madhyama Grama. You had something else called Gandhara Grama. I won't get into all that right now. But I just want to tell you this idea of Shruti. This is what I came to. Now, the reason I came to this is there's a very famous term of 22 Shrutis that we keep about Indian classical music. Its relevance is actually only here. When you had fixed frequencies, the Shrutis were how the, the gap between two fixed notes was measured. These were not considered actual notes. They were considered the gap. So what in fact they describe is that the sound of sa in it has the whole sound of all the four, is how they described it. Meaning the sound of sa fills the sound before the other sound. And the possible sounds that is possible between these two is four, is how they've described it. Now, this, if you add this whole thing up, what do you get? You get 22. In Madhima Grama, this was distributed differently. In Gandhar Grama, differently. Now, this 22 Shrutis is very important to understand why it is not relevant today though it's talked about most widely. Now, sometime, whether it changed, whether it was influenced, whether it was, we don't know, okay? But around the, say, 6th century, we come across changes even in descriptions of these music. We come across places where a variety of ga is allowed as an additional point of reference, but not as still, it is not given the status of a primary note, but the term Antaragandhara comes in. But Antaragandhara is not considered still a pure, complete note. It can be used in raga, in melodies, ragas, in melodies or jatis, where the original ga is not strong. Still, it is not given a note. So now, this 22 is what we have still retained today as an idea. That's, why, that's what I came to say. Now, the music, whether it is, Carnatic or Hindustani music, we use or inflections, inflections, inflections. Now, people will tell you that when you sing this, you hear this Shruti. What they are talking about is they are trying to refer it to this 22 points of reference. Okay? Now, the reality is, if I was going to Mm. You must pardon my bad throat today. Mm. Mm. There's a raga called Gaula. And everybody says in the raga you can hear the Ekashruti Rishabha or the Ri which is on the first point. So, is how you sing the re. The fact is, every re, this same re sung by 10 of you is not going to be the same. 
it's not going to be the same now the ekashruti is not a point it could be a mean around which there are variations and there are possible movements sorry my voice today makes the reed sound different from how it will sound this evening but all your ears will still make it sound like the ekashruti rishva that's the average that happens to the listening so the 22 shrutis in many ways is irrelevant to today's music in my opinion because our music is today not based on on fixed notes or fixed frequency notes but on the movement that happens 22 shrutis exist in between the notes that we sing we touch upon all the approximations of many of them when we sing gamakas therefore to say that this is the point where you sing this ma this is the point where you sing this dha the actual non gamaka position of the note in many ways is non non consequential to the music we sing that's what i was trying to say i more to say because it is the major issue of of debate of discussion and it continues and there is never going to be any resolution for the next 100 years now the idea of the gamaka itself is a very very old idea it's an idea that is found right from prakara he talks about 15 different gamakas and that gives us a very interesting perspective as far as again south indian classical music is concerned is a treatise is called raga vibhoda by somanatha i think it's in the 17th century where he describes so many kinds of gamakas from there we come to the sangeeta sampradaya pradarshini in so talking for the last 10 minutes specifically about that so i'm not going to go into it but a gamaka can be described in many ways like i said oscillation ornamentation inflection whatever you want but the important point of what a gamaka it deals with one note first of all a gamaka deals with one specific note and the movement of that specific note now there is also in a sense within that one note you could have three notes you could have two notes you could have anything but the fact is you are actually still dealing with one note you may say for example in carnatic music so the note i am singing is ma but i am not singing ma at all i am singing gapa 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 is what i am singing so no it is still ma no no hang on the ma moves let's let's describe it in a no i'm not a scientist so i can say what i want basically <laughs> let's say that it's a relationship between a note and its notes around it and it's a kind of a friendship actually in every raga there's a so ma every note actually is not a specific point in indian classical music when sung with gamaka it's a bandwidth of a position so ma ma it's a different ma ma da ma re sa ga ga ma ni ra ba ma ni ga ba ma so the note is ma if anybody said it was ga i'll say no not in begada not in this raga so there are, i'll come to the different varieties of of gamakas you can sing so it has evolved through a period of time it has been reinterpreted for many many times and it is possible to see why it has changed or you can hypothesize why it has changed why it could have changed now it also poses some very interesting problems especially in terms of ragas now what is a raga again raga can be described as a set of melodic motifs can can you keep your questions to the end if you don't mind because i'll forget what i need to say thank you um a raga can be looked at as a collection of melodic motifs i i also like the word we use but many people call phraseology it is question of phraseology and there are and different phases put together become a raga now in carnatic music there are two things that happen which needs to be discussed and told in terms of what understanding of a raga for a long period of time a raga was exactly this it was 
a collection of melodic phrases that were put together and given an identity. Identity could have been based on time, could have been based on emotion, could have been based on melodic notes it used, so many things. There was a certain classification system that started getting involved around from around the 1500s called the Mela. Without going into too much detail, the idea was very simple. The idea was ragas that used common notes. Let's put them all together in one basket. It was as simple as that. One basket, if, a, if, if you take sa, ri, of, ri one, say ga two, ma one, dha two, ni two. Any raga that used these notes was put into one basket and given one identity. This identity was called the mela. It did not mean that every one of these ragas need to have all these notes. It did not mean that. It did not mean that every one of these ragas had to have these notes in a specific way. No. It had these notes, therefore it's in the basket. Simple. How do I refer to the basket? Very simple. Get the most popular raga's name and title the basket according to that. That's all was done. At some point of time, I guess the human mind couldn't keep quiet. And it said, you know, if you start doing this, why don't we create permutations and combinations of notes and call them a new scale, a new raga? This changed the idea of a raga to a different identity. This term that Dr. Muthi used, arohana, avarohana, does not exist in musicological history till about almost the 18th century. This, no raga was ever described in terms of its scale or its ascending or descending scale. Ragas were always described on the basis of phrases. If you see many treatises, they'll give you 10 to say these are the phrases that make the raga. Now, when you started saying what they called uh, prastara, or when they started computing different possibilities of notes to create different scales, raga got two definitions according to me. One was a raga that was about phraseology, that was about phrase-based identity. Another was a synthetically created idea, which was based on purely what notes it had. And you could basically play around to the permutation and combination of it. Here, two different schools evolved. One was by one great scholar, one great musician, Muthuswami Dikshitar, in his tradition. Another was, of course, Tyagaraja and other tradition. Not going into that. But why I'm saying this, this changes the idea of the raga also. So the, the way you analyze our old raga like Begada will be totally different from the way you will look at, say, a raga like, hmm, let's say, Simhendra Madhyam. Simhendra Madhyam was a purely constructed scale of certain note varieties. Begada is a raga that has been created that is evolved through phraseology. Musician, I can tell you, the way I deal with Begada will be drastically different from the way I deal with Simendra Madhima. Simendra Madhima, I can deal with as purely as permutation and combination. Probably a computer will do a better job than me in creating better permutations and combinations. Whereas Begada, I can never work on permutation and combination. I can only work on phraseology. So creativity in phraseology-based music Vis-a-vis -vis creativity in scalular-based raga, scale-based raga, is different. Okay? There is a point of overlapping, but the percentage of overlapping differs in these two identities. Gamaka creates some other interesting points. Now, suppose I sing, mm, so many times we lie in Carnatic music. And only if you lie, will it sound like the raga. I'll give you an example. Mm. For the raga is Kamboji. Again, pardon. For... In this raga, this is padaya sa, padaya sa. Okay, it's 
सेम थिंग कैन बी पनी सेम थिंग दैट आई एम सिंगिंग देर इज नो डिफरेंस बिटवीन द दा एंड द नी इन मधिमा होती इट बिकम्स नी इन कामबोजी इट इज दा एक्टली सेम थिंग बट यू सेम टू डिफरेंट नोट फॉर इट इन टू डिफरेंट वाई बिकॉज ऑफ द गमका सो यू हैव टू अंडरस्टैंड नाउ आई गिव यू अदर एग्जाम्पल विच इज of different in community we have 12 swaras 12 notes and 16 names is that understood okay therefore when i sing ari sodi ari nevani sari i sang exactly same thing again I said, "Ga, ri, ri zani bani sari, ga ri zani sari ga." So you saying ri, you saying ga, but because it and it is Madhyamati, it changes. This is at least in this case you can say it has a reason because the position of that ga and the position of ri are the same. They just called with different names. But in my previous case. it's not this is clearly a different position this da a different position that ni has a different position yet when you put the gamaka on to it it sounds exactly the same exactly the same na 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 is a phrase we all sing we sing it in 10 ragas sometimes it is ni sari ri sa ni pa sometimes it is ni sari ri sa ni pa ma is there ma is there but a good musician should not go to that ma so i i want to talk about this because these are places where there are there are issues there are issues in trying to comprehending what is it are we singing a da or are we singing a ni so unless you understand the phraseology of the raga you can never detect whether you are singing the da or the so the phraseology of the raga is what defines what tamaka you are singing what note you are in where you are going to go Otherwise, it can never be detected. Now, in terms of the types of gamakas, uh, he has already uh, covered it. If I sing a simple phrase like, mm. ah, she mentioned that sometimes you cannot notate it. I would like to beg to disagree on that. There are cases where you can actually put two, three symbols on the sim on on a single note and notate it. You can. I'll talk about it later. Mm. Uh, Now this phrase. Na 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 na, sa ni da pa ma. There are about six varieties of gamakas that have seen this phrase. Sa ni da. So in one four note, I have sung almost actually different types of. So putting these gamakas is very very essential to understanding for what gamaka it is. What is the note that is actually being sung? Otherwise, you can never figure out what is being sung. So it's very important not to. Identity from Gamaka identity. We have to look at both these things to get any comprehension of Gamaka. Once you split it, I don't think there will be comprehension. That's what. Um, I was also talking. I was supposed to talk about other uh, Carnatic music. Uh, it's very very difficult to give a kind of a you know forty minute speech on its form. I'm not going to talk about concert presentation. I will talk about components. in terms of compositions today's carnatic music all the compositions that you render we have about 11 different compositions varna geeta swarajati illana javali padam kirtana 
I can go on. Ragamalika. Okay. Every one of them follow one basic format. This is true of Carnatic music of the last, say, 400 years ago. Where's my pen? Is yeah. Basically, she had mentioned it also, but I'll just tell you. Every one of them have a Pallavi, Anu Pallavi, Charana, or variants of the same. Meaning, you could have a composition Pallavi. Usually, it's a, it could be a two-line statement or a single-line statement. And Anupalvi is usually an elaboration, usually a four-line statement, four-line continuation. I'm talking about lyrically right now. And the charana is usually a multiple of this. So if you, this has four, this has eight, there are exceptions. Like anything I say, there are exceptions. Nothing is the rule. There's absolutely no, no, no fixed rule. But this is the generalization. Now, there are variants of this. In a kirtana, you could have a Pallavi Anupalvi charana. You could have only a Pallavi and Anupalvi. You could have only a Pallavi and a Charana. This is one form called Kirtana. In a Varna, you again have the same formations. But in between these formations, you create other components. So in each of them, it's like, so the point is that every musical form today in Carnatic music follows a basic baseline structure of Pallavi and Anupalvi Charana. Every one of them. Even a Ragamalika follows the same thing. Now, in terms of how they have evolved, the older forms of compositions, you had something called prabandhas, you had many other forms which were totally different. Some musicologists believe that the, this form came from there. I'm not one who is completely convinced by that, this, by that argument. Uh, I don't see in, enough uh, empirical proof to accept that it could have evolved. It might have, it's possible, but the prabandha was a very, very different kind of a musical form, melodically. Now, melodically, these variants are completely different. Another important point here is the use of language. We seem to a lot of times forget that language plays a very, very important role in artistic, in musical aesthetic. And the way, mu especially in compositional music, the way language interacts with melody and the number of syllables used per note or for every three notes affects the way the also heard. The accent intonation of language and intonation of melody is also very, very interesting to look at because the, these two things together is what gives you the experience that you're having in compositional music again. So in a Varna, for example, you have far less lyrics. Now, if we're going to sing a sample, I'll sing one of the very, very famous uh, Varnams. Mm. <laughs> See, there were only I said I sang only three syllables, but I kept saying A, A, E, E, E. This compositional form itself has huge vowel extensions. Whereas the same raga, if I sang a kirtana, hmm. you can see the vowel extensions are completely gone. So the melody, the aesthetics of the raga itself change. So I think another important point in compositional music is also the interaction between language. And it also changes between language and language. Between Tamil, between Tamil, Kannada, Telugu, Samskrita, the sound changes. The way the singer accents will change. It should change. The same phrase when sung with a Telugu word will sound slightly different with the same phrase sung with a Tamil word. Because the language also affects the way the music. So, compositional music, improvisational music, of course, alapra, alap is pretty much the same as you see in, in Hindustani classical music. Uh, the syllables that we predominantly use are tadari and ano. There is no specific meaning for this, absolutely. It's, it's more, I think, support structures that is used. And 
it is usually sung as a prelude to a composition that is presented in the same raga. History of the Alapana itself is very, very interesting. I, like I said, I, if I start going into that, it will take a long time. But it is very interesting to see how the whole concept is coming. The other two forms of improvisation in Carnatic classical music, there are three, but I'll talk about two first, is Neraval and Kalpanaswara. Both these improvisations are found within the compositional rendition and are attached to the composition itself, to a specific line to, to the composition. Nerval is basically melodic elaboration of a given line in a composition, keeping intact the rhythmical and syllabic structure of that line. This is very important. It is not that I can just take that line and expand it however I want in how many verse cycles I want. No. For example, this is line okay when we sing when we expand and improvise on this line we do keep in mind the syllabic structure of that line as far as the composition is concerned. So I cannot extend it beyond one cycle. I can't, I can't extend the syllable beyond its position by too much. So if I was improvising, So, there are many varieties. So, the point is that Nerval singing also keeps in mind the compositional structure of that line. And beyond a point, we cannot expand the syllable positions. Some people are very, very strict about keeping the syllable positions exactly where they should be. Some musicians are not. I think there is, I am one who moves it around a bit because I think that gives some breather to it. But at the same time, you can't finish the line within half the cycle and then have all the gap to fill with just an intonation of R E. Kalpanaswara singing. Many of these improvisations are similar to what you find in this tiny music. It's just a question of how it is put together and the melody, melody of the raga that makes it different. Kalpanaswara singing itself is about singing the swaras to basically simple, it's to tag notes to a certain line, a certain point of a certain word. It can be a line, it can be a specific word anywhere, and that makes it mathematically far more complex. So the same line, this is done multiple speeds it's done with lot of math sometimes there's a lot of math that is included here geometric arithmetic progressions that's that's a completely different world by itself these are the basic improvisational ideas one more which is something called Tanam. Many of this is also found in Hindustani music. In also in Drupad, you'll find a lot of similarity in, in what we sing in our improvisational side. There is a similarity. Tanam is a rhythmical presentation which is not bound by a rhythmical cycle. So basically, it is formations of fives, fours, sevens, nines, but it's not bound by a cyclical tala or a cyclical rhythmical con construct. Okay. 
Now, this is Thanam. This is again elaboration. This is basically the, the big components that I can quickly tell you about. I'm going to take questions now before I talk about the Pradarshini if there's any questions. Yes? In some cases, there's no ma. When I say ma, you're not plotting ma at all. No, 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 no. I'm telling you, I, I understand a question. I'm giving you an answer. When you say ma, you'll pro probably not plot anything. Plotting gappa, 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 gappa. That's what you'll be plotting. They'll probably answer the question. Don't say ma. When you say ma. When you say ma, I didn't call it an average. I didn't call it an average. You want to know that's a mean? No, no, no. I'm just extrapolating to another statistical In which gamaka? Which ma? If you talk about ma, that is different from ma. Those two different things. In this case, sometimes you're not even going up to the next. Sometimes I will give an example of places where in that raga context, when I say next note, I'm talking about the note of that specific raga. Okay. Sometimes you're singing a gamaka which is in between its the next note's actual position and this note. So you start from this note, but you're in between somewhere. And there is no specific position. Like I said, between each musician, that position will vary. But the average will still make it sound like that raga. It completely depends on the context of what specific movement you are discussing. Some cases you are hitting the full note. And you sing, for example, in raga called darbar, we sing, we sing, ga ga ri ga ga ri sa ri ri ma ri ri ma ri ri sa ri ga ga ri sa. Actually, sorry, ri ma. I'll talk about another thing. Like ri ga ga. Rima ri ri ma ma ri sa ri is what I'm singing. Ga ri sa ri ma ri ri ma ma ri sa ri. Okay. So the just before we finish. So it depends on which context you're singing that gamaka to what that value of the note that you're uttering is. Your question. How many pitches is what you're asking? Statistically, I don't know, but I can tell you. It does not appear at all. In some case, cases, it appears towards the end of the movement. In some cases, it could be right there. Ma, gama, 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 that's what you're singing actually. Ma, ma, ah, ah. That's why I sang this in short. You could have. I, mean, I want to talk. I, when I talk about the Pradarshini now, for 10 minutes, I will talk about and the different contexts. And then you will probably understand that you have a question. Yeah. And I want to answer your question, Raga Malika. You asked a question about whether you could change the Raga, right? No, no, I'm going to answer a question you asked him in context of Carnatic music because it makes sense. You asked a question whether you could change from one Raga to another Raga in a composition. That question, there are compositions in Carnatic music which exactly do that. Shri Vi. Shwanatham Bajeham Radha Shri Radha Chatur Dasha Bhuvana Rupa Radha Malika Bharana Taranat Vita Janasam Sara It's different Radha. It's called Arabi. It's a composition that actually travels sometimes there is the longest, which is 108 ragas in one composition. So now you can ask it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 
Um, I don't agree with you. I'll tell you why. It's also got to do with the evolution of the concept. That also plays a very important role. It's not a question of conceptual. I'll tell you, I'll give you a case. Some scales, they are only founded by note positions, only purely by note positions. They, their character is not evolved on phrases. Okay? Well, it's not a question of conceptualization. Therefore, when, I, when you sing it, any, any musician in the world sings it, not just me. The point is you have to constantly refer to the various positions of those notes to make sure that the identity is not another set of notes which has similar one note that is changing. Okay? Whereas in a phrase-based concept of a raga, you could have, I will give an example for that. Okay? This is a phrase. This is better. Now, exactly the same notes is found in the raga called Kamboji. But this phrase can never be found in Kamboji. Whereas I will take two scales for you. Dignesh, why don't you sing? Sing Simeandra Madhyam. Any phrase in Simeandra Madhyam. Any phrase you want. I will give an example. I am going to ask him to sing a phrase in this raga Simeandra Madhyam. Any phrase he wants right now. Any phrase. Short of phrase, short of phrase, please. Sing the same phrase in Shanguru Priya. Sing the same phrase in Vachaspati. Okay, sing in some of the raga that comes to you fast. What I'm demonstrating to you here is, though you may not be able to figure it out, is that the same phrase, same set of notes, not even phrase, which he sang in raga X, can be sung in almost 27 scale-based ragas, or even 50, with no unique identity to any one of them. Whereas, in a phrase-based raga, this can never happen because the conceptualization is based on a phraseology it's evolution rather than conceptual evolution that's a better word it's evolution is based on phraseology when the evolution is based on phraseology it's the phraseology that drives you in, con in conceiving what it is in form whereas if it is evolved on the basis of only perfect note positions then this possibility is always there in fact if he sings a, 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 a lap in Raga Simendra Madhyam, I can use a computer, just change one note for you, play the whole alap in another raga, and you will, you will sound exactly like the other raga for you. Whereas you take two phrase-based ragas and try the same thing, it can never happen. So the, the evolution of what the raga concept was is what determines the perception and the interpretation and the, and the internalization of the idea. It's very simple. I think the simplest thing as a musician to sing is scale-based ragas. It's a piece of cake. You give me any scale now, I can sing an ala for half an hour. You give me a phrase-based idea, I'll have to internalize it far more. Because as I'll have to internalize it far more to understand the relationship. Also, I want one point here. The idea of improvisation in Indian classical music is very important. Is improvisation about creating new... new what is... Everything is new. You know, every, you know, we love to say that improvisation, we create everything new. I think, I think it's nuanced. We have to understand in a slightly more nuanced fashion. When you have a phrase-based idea, you have motives. Say you have 35 motives that make a raga. How do I create them? I can't use notes to create. I can to a certain extent, maybe. Like I said, there are percentages I can use. But then you have to evolve aesthetic forms, phraseology, that go behind the known motives. Okay? This is a different form of improvisation compared to a permutation combination kind of improvisation. 
Sometimes the same phrase can be repeated four times, but it's different. Exactly what is different about it? It's the same phrase. It's just the small nuance, the small change in the way the same ga is given or the same ma is given is also improvisation. So improvisation is not about creating new structures only. And even in creating new structures, there are different ways. Permutation, combination, phraseology. Improvisation is also about aesthetic renditions that are different every time of the same phrase. So improvisation itself is far more nuanced than one absolute of saying everything created is new today. Now this whole question of what is new will, will start hitting us. What is What do you consider new? So improvisation itself should be understood in a, in a spectrum of ways. Only then we can really understand what we mean by improvisation in Indian classical music. Otherwise, many times I've heard, my, my students have come and told me, you know that day alap was the same as this day's alap. Now the reason they say that is because the phrase that they heard is the same. But then if I say, now just listen to it again, then it's not the same. It's the same notes, but the phrase is not the same. So there are many, many shades to this, is what I'm trying to say. I'm a Carnatic musician. Anyway, go on. Mm. Yeah. I know. I, I know Bim Plessy and uh, Malkos, yeah. How do you define it in Shruti concept? Tell me now. How are you going to define beam plus C need to me? Or da? Define it to me in Shruti. What Shruti is it? This is the point. Ah, this is the point I'm coming to. The way you sing that da and me today will change from the way you sing it tomorrow morning. I can tell you if you put it on a computer, any of the people here can prove it to you. The dip will be by one cent, maybe two cents, maybe three cents. It will be the case. That's the beauty of music. Why are you trying to make it science? It's not science. It's their job. That's their problem. Music, that's the whole thing. The whole thing is about auditory reception of what we are hearing. Right? It's a question of auditory reception. It's about aesthetic and auditory reception. The mind will make sure that the... When is the time you'll think it is Besur or when it is a different Raga? Let me ask you this question. You will say this note is not this Raga when it moves beyond a certain spectrum of possibility in this Raga. So you have to first accept that there is a spectrum of possibility. So once you say spectrum, it's not one Shruti. It is many microtonal positions. Andolan is one way. One way. There could be so many ways of the same microtones being sounded. So the question is, this spectrum is independent on the instrument. Timber of the instrument also affects this spectrum. Between a sarod and a sitar, the same spectrum will sound different to the same way. But it will still sound like Malkons or Bimplasi. Because... Your ear is accepting that whole range as an identity with that note in the context of that raga. All this has to be said. So that's the beauty of our music. That is the whole... Please. Okay. Yes, of course. Absolutely, you can. <laughs> yeah, that is also. But also, in some ragas, you do not you do not sing this note in its position. Also, the raga's identity itself is to move the note. That's the whole beauty of the note, right? So, if you're going to find it, so search for it and find it there, then you're looking for the wrong wrong note in the wrong raga. So the, the whole other point of saying about 22 Shrutis is you don't, if you look at it, there are probably 600 Shrutis. How do you know? Right? So the point is it, it is not bounded. Don't talk about 22. It's irrelevant. Like I told you, 22 came from a totally different musical concept. What happened was that concept got carried over in musical treatises and got incorporated into even our uh, fixed pitch kind of music that evolved later. He has to listen and repeat. 
फुल स्टॉप Uh, that is uh, uh, Sambadi in Hindustani music is far more relevant than in our music. Let me tell you that here. We do not, uh, not necessarily have, we do have Vadi Sambadi and we will talk about it. Again, Vadi Sambadi is a concept that came from far, far behind from Jati system itself. But the whole idea is when you're talking about a student, the last thing you must be telling the student is about Pendu Shutis, in my opinion. The only thing the student needs to do is listen and sing. Okay. Okay. Yes. It will be multiple frequencies. They can prove it. I, I, in fact, they saw it. In fact, in the, I think in one of the histograms that you had presented, you found that when she presented, I think, Gandhara or Rishabha or Vanraga, this were the possibilities with the peak over there. So the peak was the maximum time that that point was preferred, but there was a bandwidth of possibilities of re. So even in the histogram, it only shows that that it is not a specific point. Unless, like he said, you just stand on exactly the note every time and don't sing any gamak and don't sing any... That, that, is, a simple, that, that is the Shruti. That is what I'm trying to say. The mean is what they've given a certain number. But that mean is not something you're going to be singing. First you, no, first you, need, to accept, first you need to accept... Exactly. Mean may not be in the right place also. She's right. That's not the point. That is not the point. It is... What they are also finding is what we are doing actually in many ways. They are also finding that there is a bandwidth. They are also finding there is no absolute position. They are also finding that the aesthetic of the sound, making you recognize it as note A or note B, is not a point but a set of possibilities. The consonants, I mean, that is always there. No, but even the consonant system will only work on uh, when they're, when they're on the pure note positions. The notes are harmonically consonant, but there are ragas. Uh, okay, now we are coming to a different subject. Aesthetic pleasure, conditioning, I'll have to get into another thing. That's a total, because aesthetic pleasure is a very, 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 very subjective matter. And it's a social conditioning and aesthetic conditioning. To say pleasure is something we cannot discuss. But in terms of all ragas having vadi samvadi consonants harmonics that is there there is always one note that is on the higher vadi samvadi but that is not the only factor that is not the only factor that it and especially when you have gamaka and especially when you have gamaka then sometimes even in our music the no no but he was talking about the position yeah that is normal that is there. That is fair, of course. I mean, for all the scales, there will be some vadi, some vadi you can find. But he was talking about in terms of the movement and why it should not be in a position. That's what he was asking. I have something else to say for five minutes. Can I, can I get to that? Because that's something... Yeah, it's just going... Can I have the... See, this is a part of a research project. Yeah, remote, please. I'll just... I'll. Can, can I take it after I finish this, wrap this up, because this, uh, they want me to talk about it. Yeah, sure. It's not switched on? So 30 seconds. I, I would rather, I think, let her ask the question, actually. Because <laughs> she has been waiting, if you don't mind. Yes, computationally, psycho-ecological averaging and statistical averaging and psycho-statistical averaging are different. You can have a discussion over lunch. Um, I don't know, but see, if you look at it that way, the number of phrase-based ragas, I mean, there are more ragas in Carnatic music, yes, in general. That The reason for that is, no, the, no uh, the reason for that larger number of ragas, which my, my personal artistic opinion was a 
was totally unnecessary. Though I'm a Carnatic musician, I'm going to say that the scale-based ragas, I don't see them as contributing to the melodic beauty. I would rather keep limited ragas that Hindustani music has, to be very honest with you. Um, um, in Carnatic music, the phrase-based ragas were there. We had a huge set of them, about 50 for a long time. And a lot of ragas were, see this whole Hindustani Carnatic point is a very, very, uh, you know, when it, it had identity, it's actually had multiple identities. It's identities. We seem to think there's one music that's split into two, like some fraction or something. No way. Actually, each social context had a different interpretation. Various social contexts got together and gave Carnatic its music. Various social contexts got together and gave Hindustani its identity. So, today in Carnatic music, we have huge number of scale-based ragas. But the number of phrase-based ragas are still less. That itself shows that it's not possible to create a phrase-based raga, raga overnight. I can create a scale-based raga now in front of you. Not very difficult to do. That's why I said a computer will do a better job than any of us in this room. Whereas phraseology is, is the beauty of our music. So, there, um, again, I'm not questioning the beauty of singing a scale-based raga or the aesthetic pleasure. That's not being questioned. I'm talking about the conceptual idea of the two. And I have my stand on it. So. The Sangeeta Sampradaya Pradeshini, I'll just quickly run through this, is a treatise that was written in 1904 by, I, I'd probably move, by um, a great scholar, Subrahma Dikshitar. Subrahma Dikshitar belonged to the family and the Shishya Parampara of Muthuswami Dikshitar, who is one of the greatest composers in South Indian classical music. Um, this treatise is very, very important. Why? multiple reasons. Post 18th century, there was no treatise that gave us an idea of ragas, history, music, compositions, and contemporary practices. This man probably could have fetched about 200 PhDs minimum if you look at that, if you look at that treatise. Every line is, is, is a gold mine. And he wrote it before, giving us a document that covers history of raga music for about 200 years. He talks about compositions in it, specifically to his tradition, which is Muthuswami Dikshita and others, and also comments on contemporary practices. So it is amazing. And he, and apart from this, the most amazing thing, he was the first man who tried to notate Carnatic music with symbols for every gamaka at this scale. There was one attempt before that in the late 1800s by a person called Chinnasamy Mudalyar, who in fact was the reason why he wrote this book. Now, first of all, how can I validate this? Can you go to the next? Where's the quote? First of all, validate this document. I mean, many people will say, what's the big deal? How do you know it's all true? If you cross-reference things he has given in the document with all the, all the treatises, you see, you see it, you see the referencing. If you look at some of the samples of musicians in the early 20th century, you see a connection between the treatise, his notations and them. Even oral traditions in the Dikshita Sampradaya show us resemblance of what he has written. And it's an amazing document. And what I am involved in for the last four or five years is one fine day we just thought, this, this document has been used by musicians right through last year. Um, like picking up any book, you will pick up the book. And you see the name of the raga. Every musician knows how to sing it. So they would just sing the song. But according to the aesthetic movement that we are conditioned to, to believe is that raga. Nobody tried to sing exactly as notated by the gentleman in 1904. His music is old by about 60 years from the time he wrote it. So, say music of the 1840s or so. So, the task that we have undertaken is to try and sing, create audio documents of his notations exactly as he has notated it. And to see whether music has changed. And of course, it's scary. So, we document every composition. Of, right now, we're doing only Muthuswami Dikshita's compositions. I'll just go through the contents of this document so you, you have an idea of what it has. It has 1,700 pages, 76 stories of great composers, theoretical sections, and the most amazing part is his errata. I have to say, his errata is astounding. Imagine this man did it physically in 1904. 
His errata is almost perfect. And he has given a guide, instructional guide, on how his notation has to be understood. Every Gavaka symbol he has given, he has said in the, and first of all, this whole treatise is based on the Veena. So all the Gamakas are based on the Veena. He has given context and saying, Udukkal, in this Raga, in this fret, putting your second finger here, pulling it to that extent, pulling it back to that position, is how this Ramaka should be understood. So, and one side story about him, I don't know how many of you know, Bhatkande actually came to the south searching for the Sangeeta Ratanakara. Because somebody told him that you can find it in the south. He didn't find it. And he met this gentleman. And from him, Bhatkande is supposed to have taken his copy of the Chaturdandi Prakashika, a treatise written in 1620. The manuscript apparently was given to Bhatkande by Subhanam Dikshitar. I'm talking about what, late 18, early 1800s. Now, these are the compositions in this treatise 229 Kirtanas of Dikshitar, 10 Prabandhas, uh, these are older forms, Ragamalikas, Kirtanas, Sula, these, I mean, this is go on, go on and on. It's, it's, it's a huge document. It's, it's a magnus opus. Now, I'll come to the most important part. Each raga, in their school, they use the word raga and raga. And every raga, when he, if you open a chapter of raga X, he'll first tell you which chakra. Chakra is just um, the 72 ragas are split into groups. Okay? So, six, six raga. So, that's what I mean by that. This Lakshana shloka, a shloka that describes the raga, tells you what time it can be sung, what notes are missing in that raga, those kind of things. Then, murchana, this is an old term that he used, which is the sequence of notes in an ascending, descending order, not to be understood literally as arona, arona, but he said it is arona, arona, but he means it in a more nuanced way. Then details, this is amazing. Every raga, he will give you phrases that are named for the raga, that identify the raga. He will also tell you, in our tradition, we have done this, but there is another tradition where they did. He will also tell you that for 300 years of this raga, this phrase was never found, but now it's accepted to the raga. He will also tell you with great disdain that contemporary practices have changed, which is with great disdain that he has written it sometimes. So, then a history. He'll give you, so, and then if you study every one of those compositions, it's beautiful. The amount of information you get, amount of understanding you get. So every raga is like this. This detail is there for every raga that is described. And compositions of depending on how many compositions there are. So, I'll go to the notation system that he did. He, of course, this is in English. The treatise is written in Telugu. So the whole treatise is in Telugu. It has been translated to, to Tamil. And uh, in fact, now I'm, I'm on the editorial board with the Music Academy in Madras where we are translating it into, uh, transliterating it into English. And we, are, we still have a long way to go. Now, some of the Western classical people would recognize many of these symbols. Chimisami Mudaliyar was a Roman Catholic. He was the guy who tried notating Carnatic music in the 1800s through journals. And the journals were called Oriental Music in, in, in European Notation. So he is the man, it's a, and that is a very interesting book by a um, journal by itself. I have pieces of it, I've seen it. And whether you agree with the work or not, I think it's tremendous work at that period of time, with time sequences put in, with movements put in, all in Western Notation. Obviously, he is the one who supplied Subrahma Dikshitar with these possibilities of symbols for notes. So, he used these notes, these symbols. Now we'll come to the Gamaka. This is the interesting part. Now, what you find is, he has given about, I think, 12 or 12 varieties of Gamakas or something like that. I don't remember the number. But we found that some of these Gamakas, even their interpretations have changed. Now, this Kampitam, this is to me uh, the most killer of the lot. Because, according to his description, it is an Something like a vibrato, something like a vibrato. So you have ma, but you you move it without touching any of the notes next to it. Mm, ma. This is what he has described it as. But today, the same thing we see. Ma. That completely changes what that 
aesthetically sounds to you. This to me is the max, one of the major gamakas used in Carnatic music is Kampita. And change of this completely changes the aesthetic sound of the music itself to a large extent. Um, you could counter argue this, but I, I, I'm, I'm, pretty sh I, I'm pretty certain that this has played a very important role in changing how our music is sounding today. Then, this is called Spuritam, basically an ascent where the second note is knocked on. Okay? Many of these things in the voice will sound the same, but in the playing technique of the veena, it will be different. Now, when I sing ma ma pa pa, it's the same as sa sa ni ni da da pa pa descent. But in the playing technique, it's different. So he calls the ascent spuritam, he calls the descent pratya. The fingering changes, therefore, it has two different terminologies. And he, in fact, says a couple of things. These two gamakas in the voice will sound the same. The difference is in the veena technique. So then you have this tirpam, some people call it no. To give up an accent on this note, some of the sound coming from somewhere. Accent on this note without actually hitting any other specific note specifically. Gama pada nisa, gama pada nisa, nisa re gama pada nisa, nisa. When I say nisa, it's just a punch. Gama pada nisa. Now this is what he calls tirpam, also nokkut. Ravai, these are some, I think Vignesh had sung this in that clipping that they had put. Now, they, this is called Ahatam and it's subdivided into two. I just want to show you to see the amount of detail this man has gone into to try and write this music and document it. But now, here, this is actually, will never be said. This note will be said as this. Pa ma, pa ma, pa pa ma, pa ma, ma ga. Risa. Okay. So in both in these two cases, this note is not said. Paga Paga Pari Pariga Paga Ma. So this is another case. He goes on. There are many. Ah, this is a very interesting. This is completely got to do with Veena playing. Now they were discussing about pulling the string in the sitar. Exactly that. Now he talks about, he limits the possibility up to three notes, but musicians after that have taken up to five, taken it beyond. But to his, what he has said, when you sing, Sa, Pa, Da, Ni, Sa, Pa, Da, Pa, Da, Ni, Sa, you actually sing, Pa, Da, Ni, Sa, and it's played on, in the Veena, it is played on the Da fret. Pada. Okay, they pull it to me and bring it back. Now here, this is called, that is one swara vali, this is two swaras vali. So you have two da and me being said for da. The pa da, da, pa da, when you oscillate it like that. Then this is the one I had actually sung. This is ga. Okay, but I'm saying rima, rima. And if you notice, there are other gamakas also given below. So this is a combination of this bali, but within them you must be singing this. Ga, ga, ga. So I must knock this actually. Ga, risa, ga, risa. It's all played on fret. Okay. So it goes on. Some of this is again related only to the veena technique. When I sing it, it's not going to make very much difference to you. Jaru, which is Sadava, Gadava, Gada, ascent, Sada. This is Udukal. Rida, Risa, Risa, Urke, Sari, Sani, Da, Pa, Magari. So, other than this, there are the symbols. Continuation of a note. If between this and this there are two Rs, and I want this guy to actually keep it as a constant Re. He puts this in between. So I'll sing it as Gari Pama. I will not sing Gari Ri Gari Pama. So he's also given for extension between two rounds. 
there are for, for different octaves, duration is speed. You talk about speed? That is in the notation. You have to see in the notation. That's a rhythmic cycle, octave. Now, ah, this is, again, this is a symbol that people who know Western music would also recognize. He used this for the start of a composition. Okay? And he used that symbol for the ending of a line. He also used symbols for repeating a line. So if he believed that a composition line had to be repeated, you will find these dots presented there. Okay? Then for speeds, single line, double speed, double line, double, triple speed. Then this is another very interesting thing. In places where there were compositions where there are only notes. Now, for example, now this is Sari Rima Ripa Mama Daga Didi Sani Dani Pasani Nisa Zadidi Sari Mada Rima Pasani Zadidi Zas Sani Zadidi Zasani Dani Papa Mada Rizani. But he says you have to split it like this Sari Rima Ripa Mama Daga Didi Sani Dani. So melodic split of every line according to his opinion is also given. Now, I'm going to stop here. What we do in our project is, first of all, I think this is what this man did was quite astounding considering many you've done. And what we do is we record his compositions of Muthuswami Dikshitar exactly as far as we can do to what he has given. Read it and render it. And in cases where we find that the Radha seems to have changed tremendously, we give two recordings. One recording exactly as he's given it. Second, if I picked up the book and sang the same notation according to the Gamaka and the aesthetic of today, how will that so song sound? And in some ragas, the changes are astonishingly different. Astonishing. Some cases, it's not. It's actually possible to notate music today using combinations of the symbols that he provided. It is actually possible to do it. Um, I think another very important thing as far as notation goes, and it was discussed once in the conference which I was in, is intent of notation. I think that's a very important point. Is the intent of notation instructional? Is the intent archival? Completely changes the nature of notation. Like when you're in music class and you want to notate something of one phrase, you scribble the phrase there. That's also notation. But you don't add anything else to the scribble. So the, the, the nature of that notation is very different from me wanting to teach you, say, a line. I can notate it for you. That's different from me wanting to notate whatever I know. Subrahma Dikshita very clearly was notating whatever he knew. That was, in fact, why he was forced to do it. He was told that you need to just write down whatever you know. So this is more of a document of whatever he knew. I don't think he meant it instructionally, but to his best abilities, within limitations of that time, he did a phenomenal job. There's just one great disappointment in the document, as far as I can see, is he never gave us the speed of rendition. He never gave us a metronome speed of what speed it has to be rendered, because that would have, I think, given us a deeper perspective of how those gamakas were actually being operated. The operation of the gamaka also changes slower, faster. So that is a definitely an area of of opening where you don't, you don't have a but if you cross refer speeds of Carnatic music early 20th, 20th century and interpretations, you do find I was saying this earlier that it seems to have been faster. Music seems to have been faster. So whether the how did the gamaka get so complex, so complex, so much more, we don't know. Some one school was like that, another school was far rather less ornamented. Some, I mean, I also believe that the possibility has also got to do with speed. Because the moment music became slower, the necessity to fill the gaps with this, the gamakas increased and therefore increasing the, uh, the degrees of the inflections. This is what I think could have happened again. Because even some of the great musicians of last century, G. N. Vasuvanam, Shamagurish Shinivasar, if you hear an old recording of them in the 1930s, and you hear the same musician say in the 1950s, one is the musician himself evolving, two, there is a change in the aesthetics beyond his own evolving. 
So there seems to have been a transition over 18, from say 18th, 19th century to 20th century, where the music did become more ornate, did become far more complex in movement. So why is a question open for debate, open for questioning and learning? Uh, I thank you all for patiently listening to me. Thank you.